I've never seen anything like it before, and to attempt to hit the ball out of there is pure madness. The winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Cameron Smith. This is the one that I've always wanted to win since I was a little kid. So it just feels pretty amazing to be able to get it done today. Uh, it's amazing that it's my destiny to be the first Aussie to win. Just incredible. Hello and welcome to Playing From The Tips Players' Championship Edition, where the so-called experts from Golf Australia magazine preview all the coming week's golf and offer up some tips that, based on recent history, could prove quite valuable over the weekend and completely invaluable. Or not. <laughs> yeah. I'm your host, Jimmy Emanuel, and I'll be guiding our in-depth look at the jewel in the PGA to crown the Players' Championship with help from some of our so-called experts, where we'll also take a look at the New Zealand PGA, International Series Thailand, and Magical Kenya Open. It's also Women's Amateur Asia Pacific Week in our region. Let's get to the so-called expert alongside me this week. First, to Golf Australia Magazine's fearless leader, a man with arguably the greatest country bakery knowledge in Australian golf, Brendan James. <laughs> BJ, before we get to this week's action, anything from last week catch your eye? Uh, really happy to see Brendan Jones get up at the New Zealand Open. Um, universe. I was going to say universe. One, of the, one of the games, very, I mean, he stands alongside Peter Senior and a host of other Aussies, which are just genuine who were just genuine good blokes and and he's been doing it for a while you know he took took time off to do landscaping during covid and looks as fit as a mally bull really does and um the so yeah it was really good to see him win i saw him throw his leg up onto an advertising hoarding just to stretch his hamstrings just like it was nothing a couple of weeks ago at bonnie Doon. and i don't think a man 20 years younger could have done it just threw it up on a thing yeah. that was the size of his head i never would have picked BJ, not this BJ, I wouldn't have picked you either, as being a super fit type, particularly later in his career, because he's not that gym rat kind of guy, Brendan, but he looks amazing on TV, like really cut mm. and fit. So yeah. yeah, good on him. And that is the voice of the doyen of golf podcasting and inspirer of flavoursome Facebook comments in response to his <laughs> weekly musings, Rod Murray. Welcome, Rod. I don't often check. Do I get any this week? Were there some good ones this week? I, I actually haven't had a good look. It was a, bit a, of a very popular this column week. this yeah. week, yes. It did seem to go. A good headline, I think. I'm not sure whether people actually read it. As long as you come up with a good headline and a poor quote, you've kind of done your job in terms of a column. Yeah, you've got to fill up the words around it. But that's what columns are about. Thank you, Jimmy. That's mostly what I do, your headlines. And poor <laughs> that's quotes, exactly right. Yeah. That's your job. Yeah. First off this week, we're going to go to Florida and the famous TPC Sawgrass and the biggest event on the PGA Tour schedule each and every year, the Players' Championship. Of course, given its status already in the game, it's one of the new designated events on the American circuit. And this week, there'll be 144 players that will compete for a whopping $25 million US dollars. First place check of four and a half million, 600 FedEx Cup points to the winner, who also receives a trophy unbelievably made by Tiffany and Co. So... What are your money washing around in Ponte Vedra Beach? That, yeah, in the lakes at TPC Sawgrass, I reckon it might be buried. <laughs> Last year, it was uh, Aussie Cam Smith who secured what at the time was the biggest win of his career with a final round 66 for a one-shot win over Anuban Lahiri from India. Uh, Smith opened both nines with four birdies on the trot, but it was his birdie at the Island Green 17th that's remembered most when he hit his tee shot right of a right pin that he certainly had no intention of doing. <laughs> Accidental hero. Yes, and then hold the putt for a birdie and then had a little adventure down the 18th to still secure. Uh, and it was on a Monday, actually, after weather smashed the event and the first round took over 50 hours to complete. Uh, Smith won't be there this week, though, of course, because he's now playing his golf with Live Golf and is now banned from the PGA Tour. That also affects this field that is regularly touted as the strongest field in golf. So we're missing a few, a number of players that would have been there last year. I think it was about 12 that played last year number of past champions, including Sergio Garcia, Phil Mickelson, all those guys that won't be there. Uh, Liv will be a high talking point this week because PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monaghan gives a Monday or Tuesday press conference in Ponte Vedra talking about the State of the Union. The union yeah. He'll get plenty of questions. I think there's a player meeting this week as well where there'll be more discussions about the recent changes to no-cut designated events and everything like that for next year. And... Greg Norman will get a mention potentially on the TV as the tournament uh, scoring record holder here, but 
perhaps unlikely. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. What's it down to? Sixth, seventh, eighth major now? Given the field strength wow. being weakened, how far down the major list do you go before you find the players now? I mean, it's tough. It's going up against the magical Kenya Open this week. That's a, <laughs> that's a hang on the NZPGA. <laughs> that's, the NZPGA there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot happening this week. It, the, yeah. the fifth major tag has kind of gone. Yeah, yeah they, they yeah. can't claim that. Correct. It did used to legitimately boast the strongest field in golf. You could talk about the major nonsense as much as you like, but not anymore. The Australian Open may have wrestled back that. <laughs> wrestled. <laughs> you it's, got, you got, it's gone above the players. Jay Monaghan will be absolutely fuming. When There'll be a call that. to the Golf Australia office <laughs> exactly this right. morning, I think. But uh, seriously, they've it's one offshoot of the path that the PGA Tour has taken, banning players. They've damaged one of their own events. Yeah, and it, it, it massively affects the, the coverage and how it sits this week when the defending champion isn't there. So, and he's um, talking about turning up in the crowd, perhaps. Did you see that little... Snippet. I don't know who did it. One of the players had a video interview with Cam talking about how much he loves the players and he watched it as a kid. I think a lot of that's a bit of trolling and stirring, but he then suggested, you know, he might go out and watch because he lives there. He does live just around the corner. So. He might go out and watch. How would that go? <laughs> he won't be able to park. Maybe so he took his parking spot away. He'll have to park and get the the bus. Get the shuttle in with, all the, shuttle in with all the other. It wouldn't people. surprise me if he turned up on the range just watching Scotty hit some balls. Yeah, well, it's possible. Anyway, I'd suggest in a Ripper GC hat. But anyway, TPC Sawgrass is of course the host venue as it has been since 1982, uh, which measures now 7,275 yards. Built by Pete Dye in 1980, it's a True tournament venue. That's what it was built for. Uh, and it's had a few little updates here and there to adapt to the ever changing pro game, most noticeably in 2016, that included the par 4 12th become a diabolical drivable short par 4, I would suggest. Uh, no major changes this year except for a new tee on the 9th, a par 5, that can push it to 600 yards. That's right, 600. Might yards. even have to hit a middle long iron in there. That's right. That's it might even, yard, might even be a thought about yeah. not going for it in two. Uh, you'd struggle to find a golfer on the planet unfamiliar with the par 3 17th and it's Island Green, which is one of the hardest nine irons a pro will hit with a miss green basically in the water, particularly with a tournament on the line. Yes, it gets harder and harder and harder. harder, and harder. Shot, it, doesn't it as yeah. the week goes on? That's and, right. And that the, green gets smaller and smaller and that hundred and odd yards gets longer and the longer. The later you hit off and the closer you are to the lead, the more and more it shrinks. And it's job not finished at the penultimate hole, of course, for people trying to win the thing with the par four eighteenth water all up the left side, very typical of tournament venues we see. Uh, and there's trees down the right and Cam managed to find both of those at one stage last year and managed to get the ball in the he hole. Ch- he chipped it from the trees chipped into it from the, the trees water. into the water, yeah, just in front of the green and then had a wedge and a putt. So, yeah, always interesting. Uh, 10 to 15 under generally gets the job done around there and there's little to no chance that Norman's mark of 24 under par from 1994 will be touched this week. It was otherworldly golf that week. That, indeed, that was kind of special. But on a, on a course, it was probably 700 yards shorter. Yep, yeah. Probably playing 800 yards harder than it does in the modern era with modern gear. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in fairness, the drivers of 1994, it wasn't the best period. <laughs> they might not have been better than Persimmon, actually. Yeah. That era, that early metal era, there wasn't wasn't great tech. You really had to be able to – anyway, we're, we're getting distracted. <laughs> Among oh, the, the King Cobra deep face was all right. Yeah, that's right. I've still got one at home. Among those trying to actually get towards that mark or at least win the tournament, the three players jockeying around the number one spot in the world ranking are the main focus. You've got John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, and Rory McIlroy. Rahm finally came back to earth last week at Bay Hill with some scores in the 70s, which I don't he, think he's too used to doing in tournament golf this year. Uh, and this also hasn't been his happiest hunting ground. He was T9 two years ago, and that is by far sort of a standout achievement for him. Scheffler's only been here twice for a missed cut and a share of 55th, but the course should match up well for the way he plays the game. And he's already run a, won around another TPC venue this year and is his own rich vein of form going. And McElroy nearly managed to put on a second red cardigan last week at Arnie's place. And he's also chasing a second win here after he won in 2019. Justin Thomas is another sort of sawgrass specialist that won here, hasn't missed the top 25 from five starts this year, and elite ball strikers are the kind that stand up here. So you've got your Max Homers and Will Zalatoris's who like their chances around here, although Zalatoris is in racing parlance lightly raced after injury, and that short putting gives me the Bits, thinking of trying to win like, look at, like, a $25 million. Dollar mirror. Yeah, Is it a yeah, that's right. It's yeah, a window into my soul. 
We got seven Aussies in the field this week as well. So we got Aaron Badley, Cam Davis, Harrison Endicott, Minwoo Lee, Adam Scott, and Jason Day. The last two, of course, are past winners here. Uh, Day arrives off another top 10 after, and basically all but has his master's invite in the bag. He needs to miss the cut here and not win a match at the match play to potentially fall out with other things going other people's way. So very much, pretty much going to get back to Augusta after missing last year. But it's also great to see some of the younger guys from Australia getting a start. Minwoo Lee gets in on a world ranking uh, yeah, category. And Harrison Endicott, who's one of the beneficiaries of the live golf situation who wouldn't have normally got a start at the players. Um, so that will be a great start to his pre J Tour career, playing a players in the first year as an eligible member. Um, they're also be hoping to become the sixth winner from Australia alongside Smith, Scott, Day, Norman and Steve Elkington, who's one of only six players to win this event multiple times, Don't five of whom did that yeah. at TPC Sawgrass. Jack yeah. Nicholas did it everywhere else. Multiple winners here are unusual. In fact, if you most players, you look at their career stats at a particular tournament, they're reasonably consistent. You know, They'll pretty much always make the cut, finish top 25, top 30. You can sort of see patterns. They clearly like courses. This is a course where you can see a guy – Miscut, miscut, win. Miscut, miscut. Yeah. Tied 42nd. It's bizarre how nobody seems to tame Sorgas. If you go and look at players' master's stats, it's amazing what a horses for courses course that is. If you play well there one year, basically lock it in. You're going to play well there every year. But this course, more than almost any other, you just get this roller coaster graph of results among players. It just says last year's, 10 years, no matter how good your form's been, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't, doesn't come up at Sawgrass. No back to back winners ever there either. That's interesting, isn't it? And I think one of the reasons is it's such a harsh test that if your game is slightly off, yeah, that's right. you're not getting yourself into a position to challenge. Whereas at Augusta, if you're an Augusta specialist, for lack of a better term, and you're missing shots slightly, you can still find your way around and then you can work your way into the week. Not the case when there's water, nasty bunkers, yeah. out of bounds, yeah. things everywhere that just waiting to bite you. And, and always get a bit of weather now. in the March yeah, window too. That's true. It always makes it a bit interesting. It baked out or windy and rainy. Yeah, so. We had that wind a couple of years ago, didn't we? It was just outrageous. Almost blew them off the course. 10 to 15 under for a, uh, a, a field of this level tells you the golf is difficult as a general winning sort of score. Yep. That is, and as you say, nobody's going to touch Norman's 2,400. You just can't see how that's ever going to happen. So that tells you how difficult the course is. And you're right, it's because every element of the game has to be working. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good show. It is a good show every year. So yeah, absolutely. I don't it's, like it's one of those tournaments of that even, the course, but even people who may have you know their questions about the golf course mm. in terms of architecture or anything like that, I think sit down and watch it and always great finishes and yeah. really good list of winners. Yeah, absolutely. It, which is another measure of a tournament yeah, that you've got, much. you know, Basically, you, if you've had a really good career, you've probably won or gone very close yeah. there. Um, and, you you know, it's always just a, a someone manages to string it all together that week and hit some shots at the right times, and particularly around 17. So very exciting week ahead. To add to the excitement, does anyone think they can pick a winner, Rob? <laughs> good luck. Who do you like and why? Uh, I've gone with Jordan Spieth because he's got a shocking record here, so that can't last forever. He missed a co- he missed some short putts last week. I mean, Spieth's a roller coaster ride these days, isn't he? If he if he's short putts, if he's holding short putts, who knows what he could do? He's a player who shouldn't finish his career without a Players Championship. And field like this probably favours him in some ways. Probably motivates him. I think McElroy's a bit the same. The stronger the field, the better they they tend to play. So I've gone with Spieth because why not? He can win it. <laughs> he showed he showed quite a lot last week. I but thought so too. And he's he's shown more flashes of that this past few months than he had for the eighteen months beforehand. You know, we had a couple of flashes. I mean, Spieth at his worst is an extraordinary player. <laughs> we forget that. Yeah. When, when he had his slump, I remember writing a column, he had his slump and made something like eight million dollars <laughs> over two years. It's like pretty handy slump. Yeah, not a bad slump, is it? So yeah. you know, we're grading on a curve there, but yes, it, uh, time for him to win another big event. And it's either going to be here or Augusta, that's for my money. You heard it here first. BJ, a Tiffany & Co. trophy for your thoughts? Jason Day. Okay. Uh, he probably – I reckon if you ask Jason what his favourite venue is, this would be, if not the favourite golf course to be on the podium. Um, before his dodgy back issues, he was just a regular top tenner here. Um, I think tied eighth in 2019, tied fifth in 2018. Um and of course, he won in twenty sixteen. He shoot um, sixty three that year, one of the rounds. He might. I think, have, he, yeah. I think he might have done. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I just think that he's he's had what four top tens in a row. Yeah. He's building to something, yeah. and I think if he wins this week, it sets up his run to winning the title that he really yeah, wants. Very much at the Masters, and and if he's not there on Sunday afternoon, I'll be really surprised. His attitude just feels right, and at that level, I, none of those guys they can all play, and he can play. But his attitude feels right to me. Well, I think the other thing too now that he's gone, what he's he's had maybe five or six tournaments now that he's played this year. Every time he goes out now, he's more and more confident that he's not going to break down and have to withdraw at some point during that tournament. And he's been around the top of the leaderboards now. He's you know he was just he wasn't talked about a lot last week, but he was a sniff going into Sunday. It wasn't beyond the realms of possibility. Shoot a low round, which he's more than capable of. He could have been right there. So I agree with you. I think he's a and he he can shoot sneaky low rounds. Hmm. Yeah. Like oh, before you know it, he's he's already six or seven under for the day. That's right. He'll make four in a row, and and, and he's pumped up, and he's yeah doing doing the Jason Day thing. You know, so I don't hate that tip, BJ. I considered it myself, but there you go. There you go. I was firmly sort of sitting with Rory until I've gone against that for no real reason other than why not? <laughs> why not? But I'm going to go with Victor Hovland, who struggled on Sunday last week to finish in a share of 10th at Bay Hill, but was right in it until the late stages. Showed some very good signs. Now, short game is a question, weakness, real concern. but Huge question mark with a massive dot under the curly bit. Yeah, <laughs> but as a quality of a ball striker as he is, there's been other players who've proved that you can get it done here if you're having a ball striking week and you're not that great of a short game Mark player. Kimer. Correct. And he's sort of in that similar thing. You look at the chipping action and you wonder how he gets on the club face sometimes, but he has got ways of getting around it and he had a bit of a scrappy week last week. So there'll be a lot of time spent, different grasses and all that sort of stuff and getting ready this week. Also a nice little Aussie connection with Shane Knight, Camera Golf Club's finest export on the back, so that would be a nice little He's still time. a member there, Shane. I don't think so. I wonder if you had any input into the changes that have happened there with uh, all that road works. From yeah, the, the thing about Hoyland, just before, the thing about Hoyland, Hovland, whichever way you print, his attitude is remarkable given all of that talent and how bad his chipping is. That's, how he maintains any sort of an attitude is remarkable to me. I, he's one of my favourite players. He's a... He's just fantastic, but that's extraordinary. It's quite improved as well from what it was, which is kind of. Bar scary. was pretty low. Yeah, exactly. for a PGA Tour player, a top ten in the world player, the bar was pretty low. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah, I just how he maintains a good attitude, but that is just uh, it's beyond me. And let's take a look at a top Aussie as well for the event, because why not? Rod, have you got a top Aussie in mind? Well, I was going to go with Jason Day, but in in light of the fact that he'll be he'll be my secondary tip, in light of the fact that BJ's tipped him, I don't mind Adam Scott. He's sneakily playing pretty well. Showed a little bit last week. He is one that does like this venue. And he obviously, he's won here, but what's he made? Uh, he's played it 20 times, made the cut 16 times. Only four top tens, but, yeah, why not? Won it 19 years ago. I know. With a horrendous second shot on the 18th. Awful. Which was just truly awful. Truly <laughs> awful. <laughs> Fat and hawked and, oh, it was just terrible. But then made a fabulous up and down, obviously. Yeah. Shades of Cam Smith. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I think Scotty, his recent form, he's only won one or two shots per round yeah. off a victory. Mm. Like he's he's close. Oh. Drive is the question still for Scotty. Finding finding fairways, he's yeah. hitting it further, but finding fairways and putting himself into a position to take advantage of his skill set has been an issue for the last couple of years to actually really get him in contention, I think. Tournament like this, there's a lot of guys who you kind of eliminate before you tee off as well. Yeah. So he's kind yeah. of playing against less in some ways. Do you yeah. know I, I think mean? particularly this week, given yeah. the field, yeah, there's, yeah. there's quite a lot. Yeah. It's his 20th trip there. He's not going to be going into sore grass going, oh, this is amazing. And he's like, okay, we've been here before. We know what it's about. So, yeah, look, I don't, I don't mind his chances. I wouldn't even put a pass him to win it. BJ, I'm going to suggest that your top Aussie is the same as your tip, given Jason Day is Australian. <laughs> would be, Correct. That's would be a little the power of t- investigative journalism t- right t- there on Australian display. winner, but then have a, t- <laughs> then a different say, but top I don't Australian. Think he's going to win. No. For me, I, I agree with Jason Day. Uh, past winner here, playing really good golf, very determined. He's a different sort of player than he was when he won in 2016. Doesn't hit it as far, but hits it a bit straighter. Putting is still very good, but noticeably there's improvement to be had from close range. And I think that's just a comfort thing gets to a golf course, like you said earlier, Beach, that he's very comfortable on and he'll see the lines a lot better and hold a few more putts. And that'll be the difference in a couple of shots to get right in there. So I think Jason is a big, big chance. But it'd be great to see Minwoo Lee in the, in the hunt. He'd thrive in that environment. Minwoo, 
honestly, this course should just be completely, totally up his alley. It just, it should be. Yeah. But Minwu, you just never know with Minwu. He does like the big events, though. Having said that, he tends to fire up. Uh, although, although I have obviously tipped an Aussie as to win it, I, I still, th- I've got a bit of a smoky Ooh. feel about Aaron Badley. Oh. For a, for a for a top ten maybe it's twice in two days you've mentioned that name to me so what's happened to you Bruce? did you have a dream or something no no I just uh, well he's he's been, he's been playing you, events he's been playing some pretty good golf and he's been playing some pretty good golf and and um I picked something the other day and and we're going to actually have it in in the next magazine uh, next issue of the magazine is that he's actually uh incorporated a drill into his full swing where he, he drags the right foot back, which, you know, uh, does a whole lot of things to your alignment and whatever. And vision of the ball. And vision of the ball, <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's dragged his right foot back and he's actually – it's it's certainly improved his accuracy, with particularly with the longer clubs. Um, Again, low bar to start with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, was, you know, when you're driving it, uh, when you're driving accuracies around a thirty percent mark, you're not going to win too much from there. No, nah. um, but certainly got the short game, yep. the putting skills mm-hmm. to do pretty well around sawgrass. Yep. Another one playing with some great freedom, just because yes. he seems to be enjoying himself, yep. which is good. It's like all that pressure of keep your card, and all that, it's all past him. Bono, who's at an age where it's like, you know what? A bit like Harrington's doing post fifty. Let's just go out and play and enjoy it and see what happens. And yeah, it seems to be working. I think you're right, Jimmy. Bads does have to feed <laughs> he's got, me, so he, he does need have, the he money. What's have, he got? He might have a bit more pressure on him. I think he's got more kids than Brad Hughes, hasn't he? And that is an achievement. Trying to get him to send a photo. Good morning to you, Brad. Hey, <laughs> yeah. yeah, trying to get him to send a photo of the kids for a story I did. I think last year or the year before was quite a challenge because you know, you know we've just had another one and we haven't had any shots taken. <laughs> since, well, I buy, assumed you had. I didn't know. <laughs> buy a new camera with a wider angle lens to fit them all in. Let's take our attention from Jacksonville Beach to New Zealand for the second week in a row. The PGA Tour of Australasia is across the ditch from us here in Australia. And BJ, you're going to give us all the pertinent information on the New Zealand PGA. Yeah, the New Zealand PGA, it's uh, a tournament with pretty rich history. It dates back about 100 and just over 100 years, 103 years actually. Um, and not surprisingly, there's some really great names on the silverware. You know, Peter Thompson, uh, his good mate Kel Nagel, who claimed the title, I think, an equal, equal record equaling seven times between, nine, get this, between 1957 and 1975. <laughs> Oh. How's that for longevity? <laughs> you want to talk about um, underrated players? Kel yeah. Nagel might be at the very top of the list. Uh, so Bob Charles, of course, would have uh, won has won it a few times. Tony Jackman, Frank Nobolo, some of New Zealand's finest. Greg Turner, and famously as good friend of the show, Bruce Young will tell you, <laughs> Jumbo Ozaki claimed his only international win on New Zealand soil in this event back in 1979. Who was on the back? Guided around by a fresh-faced young Bruce, Bruce Young. Who who uh, readily admits that his knowledge of Japanese was about equal to um, Jumbo's knowledge of English. It was pretty much restricted to the numbers. Yeah. I One, thought, six, five, eight. <laughs> I saw Bruce hosting a chat with uh, Steve Williams, Steve Williams yeah, last week Open, at the yeah. New Zealand Open, and I'd suggest that story might have come oh, up in there, talking to the punters. <laughs> it's quite... <laughs> It is quite the badge of honour. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. A player of Jumbo Ozaki's reputation to caddy for his only international victory is remarkable. Anyway, we've got, we digress. Uh, this event was obviously affected by COVID twice in the last few years. Uh, it was last played in 2021 when Auckland-based pro Teiko, and apologies if I have mispronounced your uh, Christian name there, Tay, fired a uh, course record 61 nice work. in the final round. Seven birdies and two eagles to knock over uh, Ryan Fox and Josh Geary by a stroke. Oh, there's some scalps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Ryan Fox especially. Uh, the tournament makes its first appearance at the uh, Robert Trent Jones Jr. designed Golf Harbour Country Club, which has previously hosted a couple of New Zealand Opens back big in golf the mid noughties. Yeah, big golf course. Well, I'll tell you how big, it's, big it is. Um, and as well as the 1998 World Cup of Golf. Uh, less than a year after it opened for play, which was won by Nick Faldo and, oh, question without notice, who was his partner? 1998, English golfer. It wasn't Lee Westwood. Rose. That wouldn't have been Westwood. David Carter. 
Oh, good on you, David. Well done. Congratulations, David. I always perhaps thought he, he was Welsh. Perhaps the biggest moment point. of his career. I was Big playing from the tips fan, David Carter. So he'll be happy to hear <laughs> we'll, we've just got we'll get emails. And good Carter's. morning to you, David. Yeah, well done. Um, anyone familiar with the design work of, of uh, Jones will get an idea of what Golf Harbour is like. It covers pretty sort of not too dramatic terrain on the outward holes, but when you hit the back nine, it's like, Wow, it's it takes on a whole new uh, golf on the moon. new look. Mm. Um, the trio of holes starting at the the spectacular downhill par three fifteenth, where the ocean lies just beyond the green. That's the first of three holes that play along the edge of the ocean. They'll obviously be pivotal on Sunday afternoon. Um, this gem, it's followed by two further ocean side holes. A 424 metre dog leg right par four, where you have to drive it over the ocean to get to the fairway on the other side. That's a ridiculous carry, isn't it, from memory? John Daly famously had a go at the green here during that during the uh, is the World everything Cup. John Daly does famous. I think it might be. He just, he's got a flair, hasn't he, for the Pretty dramatic? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is only which is followed by you talked about the 600 yard hole at Sawgrass. They'll be playing a 593-metre par five where the second half of the journey is uphill. Is this the one? Is it the 17th tee? You've got to carry it. It's a crazy carry off the tee, one of those two holes. that I, I played it once, and I remember the carry from the tee was just madness. I well, the, there's the big carry on 16, yeah. but then there's a ravine on, on – well, I wouldn't call it a ravine, but it's like a gully on 17 where you have to – manage yep. your way over that and then it just gets narrower the closer you get to the green it gets narrower there's out of bounds on the right and there's houses up on the right hand side should make for a dramatic finish <laughs> um, I suspect there'll be no one hitting that green in two it's, in fact that hole has been lengthened would you go for it it might be as much about it not being sensible to go for it even if you thought you might have the, the from memory it runs there. it runs from south to north so if there's any sort of southerly you might be a chance. OB right with a fairway wood in hand, hitting uphill. <laughs> but it does, it does, the green does set up well for a golfer who can hit maybe a high fade in there, start it out left of the fairway, fade it in there and it'll run up. Yeah. That's about your only option. Otherwise, they'll be just... Maybe maybe, maybe on Thursday, Friday trouble. or Saturday, but I'm not seeing anybody late on Sunday thinking that that would be the option necessarily. can guarantee that T sign with the yardage on it will get a lot of Instagram story plays from players on Tuesday, Wednesday this week. And, yeah. a, lo- and a lot of five yeah. iron second shots. So what that works out <laughs> to be about 640 odd yards. yards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A couple That's of taps. Yeah. Yeah. Uphill. Uphill. Well, with OB right. Yeah. It's a daunting third shot for most of us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good morning to John Huggin. <laughs> oh, the sickening knee-high fizzer. <laughs> Poor old Huggy. <clears throat> a shot I'm familiar with myself, Huggy. Uh, players to watch. Um, so Michael Hendry, he, he's kind of the form player in mm. in this field, um, considering he's coming off tie six last week at New Zealand Open. He's a Rony Vic Open champion and hasn't finished – Worse than t- tie twenty fifth in his five starts so far this year. Uh, Two time winner of the trophy, claimed it back to back back in 2012, 2013 when it was played down at the hills near Queenstown. Um, but he's a born and bred Auckland mm-hmm. guy. Um, lives just you know thirty odd minutes down the road. He would have played this course many times. And, and in a considerably weaker field than we saw last week, because the purse for this is, a, I think, about a tenth of what we saw last week. Yeah. So it's a much it smaller purse. The sanctioning that was in yeah. place last yeah, week. Yeah, that's right. Well. Yeah. And a bit of a left field player to watch this week um, is Englishman Connor Knight, who at the age of 27 is uh, in his first year chasing his dream of playing professional golf. 27? Yeah. Wow. That is long. Uh, he's played on a few mini tours in the UK last year. He set up a GoFundMe page, raised a little over three thousand pounds. Is now in New Zealand, and snapped up one of the twenty qualifying spots for this event. Good on him! With a five over seventy seven. Oh wow! Okay, I'm guessing Got him the start. wind must have been blowing. Um, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed that he can make a check this week. Look, they're not. You know, they're not headline makers. They're great stories, aren't they? That is an extraordinary determination to do a oh, GoFundMe, yeah. go all the way to New Zealand to play a qualifier. That's dedication. He plays out of 
Blackmore Golf Club in the UK, in England. Um, and, it, and it appears, looking at his GoFundMe page, that he's just got a lot of support from the members there. Just a good bloke. They've, you know, pitching in twenty five pounds here and there, and Good he's managed to, to scrape together three thousand pounds, and here he is. Good on him. I mean, there's more important causes in the world, obviously, but that's a nice story. Yeah. Good on him. For an- another interesting story for this week, I enjoy the fact that I'm pretty confident Hayden Barron, Jared Felton, and one of the other West Australians have actually, rather than hire a car to get from Queenstown, don't tell me they've bought something. They bought a, a blue van for a thousand dollars that looks slightly like it might struggle to make the trip. But anyway, I, I, I one to watch today yeah. as they make their way up there. I think, but dear oh dear, yes. that's that's nineteen eighty stuff. Isn't oh. it? That's, that's what they used to, wasn't there a guy on the? There was a guy who used to deal with all the tour players in the UK who came from overseas, and that's what he would do. He would he would buy and sell these second hand cars that that they would use for a year, and they, and they were bombs, you know, they'll run down, but he always had this supply of them that you'd mm. go and see wherever, Bob down at the docks in London, you go see him and he'll give you, a, he'll get you a car for you 400 quid that the, f- the four of you can, can share for them. Yeah. Ask Clates about that. That's some great stuff. Perfect. So let's get some tips for the New Zealand PJ. Let's go to you first, Rod. I'm actually going with Michael Hendry. I think particularly in this field, he mm. will feel like he should win it. Um, there are some good players in this field, nowhere near as many as last week, but he kind of stands out. And being the local, being in good form, uh, I think Michael Hendry's the man to beat. BJ, your thoughts? I'm uh, I'm plumping for Daniel Gale to get the job done this week at Golf Harbour. Um, missed the cut last week in Queenstown, also the week before when he played the Hero Indian Open. But was having a pretty good run of form prior to that, finished tied second in Sydney at the TPS Sydney. He's a gun ball striker, um, can post a low number on difficult golf courses. Great so. to watch. Funky golf swing, like yep. good action. Yeah, yep. Enjoyable player to watch. Um, I think if he can if he can find his way to a 60, 67, 68 in the opening round, Look out. he'll hang around for mm. the best part of the four days. One of the more interesting dresses in professional yes. golf, Daniel Gale. Which is different to one of the best dresses. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, for me, I'm going with my son's favourite golfer, and that's only for the reason they share the same name. Louis Dobler, for me, at Golf Harbour. 30th last week. Your son's week. name's Dobler. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Interesting. Interesting. No? <laughs> uh, 30th last week at the New Zealand Open. Showed some glimpses. I feel like a win's coming for Dobler at some stage, and this field will probably be his best chance since turning pro. Got his regular caddy, Gary Kizik, husband to Ash Barty over there, which always bodes well for a guy taking a tournament that's a smaller statue very seriously. They work well together. Louis is a top quality ball striker. This sort of place will suit up well for him, and like I said, it feels like he has to get over the line at some point, and then he'll kick on from there. And he'll want a big end to the year to try and you know, move himself up that order of merit and take advantage of all the pathways on offer there. Much higher stakes at this level in many ways than what's happening over at Sawgrass for these guys. There's whole Absolutely. careers and all of this rests on these kind of events for a player like a guy like who's got to go fund me to get to use it. This might be it for him. Yeah. Play poorly this week and that's it. Mm. You've got to mm. go get a job in whatever he did his degree in, accounting or whatever it might be. So. Mm. If you're into golf, these are really interesting stories here because they're really playing for high stakes. Absolutely. Now we head to the Asian Tour and the latest international series event, this time in the somewhat golfing stronghold of Thailand. Rod, take us to Black Mountain Golf Club if you would... Oh, close your eyes, Jimmy. Let me paint you a word picture. No, I'm not going to do that. That was a completely... International Series Thailand. So uh, this... This course hosted a European tour event called the Thailand Classic for two years in 2015 and 16, won by Andrew Dote and Scott Hen, so some good Australian form there. Uh, hasn't been played, nothing's been played there since. That tournament is back, interestingly enough, but not played at this course. Uh, it's an unusual sort of a place, owned by a Swedish consortium hmm. in Thailand, which is interesting. apparently the owner, the, the guy who found it, he just went there one year and said, oh, it's great golf, golf land here. So he up with all his money and <laughs> bought some land and built a golf course. Regular sponsor of Swedish tour players in the European tour. Is that right? Mm, I don't I think Pelle Edberg might have worn a Black Mountain logo and Johan Edfors maybe. Yeah, and yeah. Johan both got... Do they live there? They both got properties. There's housing on the yeah. golf course. Yeah. yeah. Is it Stig? I think his name's Stig. I might pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's so, Stig. Yeah. Not the Stig from the show, mm. but uh, Stig. So look, it's an interesting background. Um, 
designed by an Australian, Phil Ryan from Pacific mm-hmm. Coast Design. So fair few Australian connections there. Not a lot of live players in this field as we've seen in some of the other international series events. Certainly none of the high profile ones. You won't see your West Tysons or Schwartzels or those sorts of guys. There are some uh, former live players and some who still play on the live tour. Andy Ogletree is probably the biggest name amongst them. Um, Strains in the field. Hand and Dote, both former winners. Andrew Dote's playing, you pointed this out to me yesterday, BJ, on a medical slash military exemption. Which is an interesting category, isn't it? Well, they've got two of them. And two of them. There's two players. There's two medical, medical military categories. I think that is uh, the Asian tour's way of doing the yeah. Korean <laughs> services and stuff That's like that, the, whereas the DP World Tour no longer call people like Jen Hung Wang a medical extension. It's a just uh, membership extension. Membership extension. So the Asian sort of tour doesn't break them down and separate them. It's so, just so yeah. Dodie's is an injury one. It I would be a medical, you. yes. But isn't that a wonderfully deep, rich vein you could tap into the exemption? Because they just make up whatever they oh, need yeah, at absolutely. any given time. Just call it a category, give it a number, and just come on in. Brendan James is playing under the uh, print fat media. bastard exemption. <laughs> yeah. Cat- category twelve C. The uh, yeah the print print media. Um, over six foot four. Category. Anyway, we must have one fat man in the field. <laughs> Hand dote. There's some great names here. Pilkadaris, Terry Pilkadaris, and Marcus Fraser. A couple of old stages there. A lot of these guys are playing these international series events. Marcus Fraser was done with tour golf. He was teaching at Peninsula Kingswood, and these international series events were announced with minimum $2 million purses. He said to Mrs. Fraser, Time to go back on the road, love. Uh, I think combined with the reality of, of realising what teaching, teaching golf for a living Mark. is like for <laughs> having spoken to Marcus on occasion. That's yes. enough of that. Uh, Trav Smythe, Wade Ormsby, obviously both former live um, live players. Zach Murray, John Lyris, Todd Sinnott, Kevin Yuan, Jack Thompson, Harrison Gilbert, who I'd never heard of. Second year professional. Animal, played some of the secondary tours in Asia. Douglas Klein, been a yep. good pro-am player here in Australia, so obviously can play, so opportunities for them. Uh, players to watch it. Look, it's hard to know. There's not really big names in this field. I think some of those guys who play, the Ormsbys and the Smyers, the Ogletrees, Turk, they they stand out, Turk Pettit. So that's where I'd be looking for, for this week. In fact, I'll tip down with Angie Ogletree when we, we come to that. But it's kind of hard. These, in some ways, are harder to pick winners, I think, these events. And the same with the Magical Kenya Open, which we'll come to shortly. Because there's no real standouts. You don't really know enough about these players. And you can do lots of research and whatnot, but it, you're not familiar with how they play. You know what Rory's like. You can watch Sawgrass. And if Rory can, starts bouncing down the first fairway, well, you know, okay, look out. <laughs> Rory could be in trouble this week. But these are hard. So it'll be an interesting week, no doubt. The course is interesting. Tends to throw up interesting results. Hend here finished runner-up to Dote. Should have won that year in mm. 2015. I have a feeling, you might recall this, Jimmy, the 17th hole is a short par four with a creek in front. Yep. I've got a feeling he, he, Scott hit it in there in 2015 and made a double or something, ended up shooting 72 and losing to Dote. And then the following year, if memory serves, he drove it on the green and yep. <laughs> triumphantly stormed, uh, stormed to victory. There's a lot of people saying, oh, you know, why would you go for it under those circumstances? But anyway, so look, an interesting, interesting finish there with a short par four at 17. So it should be a good tournament. And you've already kind of given us your tip. Andy you Ogletree, I think. Anything to that? Well, he's got motivation. He's won already one of the International Series events, but he was one of those who sort of signed with Liv and any potential for a PGA Tour career disappeared. Well, didn't didn't sign with Liv, was offered a spot only in the first event. That's right, yeah. And that, earned and that got him sort of banned, and so he's got... He's, then he was, he was sent on his way. It's this or nothing, that's way. right. Two-time so, International Series winner now. Two. Yep. There you go, I must have missed the other one. So, oh, no, yeah, that's right, back in the last year. Yep. So, okay. so he'd be my uh, my tip. He's yep. going to be a bit of a specialist in this area. BJ, thoughts at Black Mountain? Well, we've mentioned him extensively there, Scott Hend. Um, Ty 12th at the New Zealand Open. Picked up a ball in the club comp at Nudgee the week before. <laughs> Is that right? What did he shoot to get that? What did he play off? I don't know. He's got probably be playing off plus six. You have to be, wouldn't it? Yep. And to get a ball in the rundown, that's some nice work. Um, and anyway, he returns to Black Mountain where he's picked up, you know, and some just good Asia, checks in his side. Asia generally, he plays well in yeah. Asia. And in Thailand, he's, he's won. Yep. He's won not only here at Black Mountain, but he's also won, I think, up at Chiang Mai. Yep. Um, winner here in 2016. He's. I think he's found something in that in this last sort of five or six weeks and. Um, There's more joy in his Twitter trolling lately, isn't there? There's a happier tone to his trolling in yeah, the Twitter world lately. Yeah, there's, there's not so much I'm hitting at shit. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> and it, it's more, you know, it might be half a chance this week. It was only at the putter really last week, wasn't it, on Sunday? Yeah. But holding back. Yeah. So, yeah, Scotty Hinn for me. 
I'm a little disappointed no one's yet mentioned Kirade Cafe Barnrat as a as a player to watch or a tip. Good call. But he's not going to be my tip, but no. I think he will be somewhere near it. He's he's sort of one of those players who's gone to the US, went at a bad time really in terms of COVID and everything like that, really struggled with the lifestyle and everything like that. Big change from Thailand, but He's showing some signs, and this is the sort of place he'll play well. One of the best short games I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but instead, it was between the two two of the runners up from New Zealand last week, Ben Campbell and John Lyris. Ben Campbell, very, very quality player and sort of goes about his work. But John Lyris, for me, uh, every single time he plays a tournament, John Lyris learns something. He's got one of the best attitudes of a new tour player I've ever seen. You in the sand belt? Two years ago? No, he had a course record at Yarra Yarra oh. on the third day and led the Vic Open for three days well. last year, has been in contention a bunch of times, played really well last week, makes plenty of birdies all the time, mm-hmm. and just a, a tough golf course suits him perfectly. So I expect him to go well and maybe even just sort of nab a, nab a chance to have a win and completely change the trajectory of his career, having only got his Asian tour card a couple of weeks back at Q School. Nice work. So now we're going to turn to one of the best tournament names in world golf. <laughs> at a golf course, I actually believe my brother is a member of. Is that right? Correct. The Magical Kenya Open on the DP World Tour. And Rod, again, we turn to your previewing expertise for a national open the, in a unique golfing market. The Muathaga Golf Club. Matiga. Matiga. Oh. There you go. In, it's in Nairobi. My research says there are 36 golf courses in Kenya, Mm -hmm. and this one is regarded as among the top five. Many people think it's the best. So look, it'll be interesting in that way. Uh, Fourth year of this tournament, the Magical Kenya Open. The Kenya Open has been played many, many times, but fourth year on the European Tour. It's bounced back between the – I don't know if it was ever European Tour previously, but it was part of the Challenge Tour. Yeah, yeah. Their records are only saying back to 2019. Last played in 2020, Ashley and Wu defending. Surprisingly decent players at the top end of the field. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Falls away pretty quickly, a little bit like the Asian Tour event. McIntyre, Cabrera Bar, Adrian Odegi, last start winner, Marcel Sam, which was a nice story a couple of weeks ago. So it's not an all-star cast, but there's some credentialed players in there. Uh, now, when the Kenyan Open was played from 1969 to 2002 at this course, here's a claim to fame. Three future Masters winners took the title here in that time. Can anybody name one? Gary Play. No. Charles Schwartzel? No. But that's not too bad. Seve, Ian Woosnam, and Trevor Immelman. <laughs> there you go. All uh, all one at this golf course between those years. I wonder if Woozy and Trevor sit at the Masters Champions Dinner and have their own section for Kenya. <laughs> Remember Open when you won in Kenya? Was it got Matiga? What about that nightclub in the main well, street in Nairobi? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about the kebabs at that van down there <laughs> after the – anyway. So, uh, yeah, look, interesting. It just tells you – probably more so in the past than these days, some of the corners of the globe that the world's best players get to at various times on their way to the top of the game. Absolutely. So there you go. Renovated this course by a designer called Pete Makovic in 2005. He's very well known in Africa. Pete Makovic does loads and loads and loads of particularly renovation work and new builds, pretty well regarded. Blake Windred is the only Australian in the field, which is interesting. So, uh, look, it's a golf tournament. There's golfers there. It'll be interesting. Um, I'm assuming it'll pop up on KO. I didn't check the guy. Ah, yes, it will be. It will be. So, look, it'll be different. You watch this and then watch Sawgrass, you're going to see see two very different types of golf courses. Golf in Kenya, despite the mountainous landscape of parts of it, is very flat and Mm. water and bunkering. and Lots of water on the back nine here, apparently. Yeah, but it's always interesting. And Mm. and can I – I think – I can confidently say this, that the magical Kenya part is actually what Kenyan tourism is all, comes oh, okay. under the magical, magical Kenya, Kenya banner. Yeah, so that's where that comes from. It's not just someone who's running a tournament says this is magical. So. Richie Ramsey made a really interesting observation about the course on Twitter I saw this morning just before we came in here, that it's only got the single line of irrigation, which means that off to the sides of the fairways is very firm and not particularly thick rough. So it really changes the nature of... How you're playing when you, you know, would have suited Seve down to the ground. Would have suited Seve down to the ground, <laughs> exactly. So there you go. For me, I like Justin Harding here. He's won before yep. at this event. Of course. Plays golf in Africa brilliantly. That's where he got his start, winning regularly on the Sunshine Tour before going to Europe and Asia and then playing a few majors and everything like that. Rough run of form of late for the South African, but he's a quality player who'll turn it around at some point, I believe. BJ, a tip for Kenya. So playing in his fifth country in six weeks, uh, left-hander Rob 
McIntyre. He's doing the hard yards, isn't he? For a player with a very big reputation, he's really working at We talk about quality players going to uh, all corners of the globe Mm -hmm. to to establish themselves. And uh, McIntyre's only, I think, won twice Mm. on DP World, which is... I would have thought this far into his career is we've talked him up unders. big, haven't we? That's probably us in the media. We've really talked him up big, yeah. perhaps bigger because than because I blame John Huggan. Well, I blame John Huggan, <laughs> but I also blame the fact that he's just such a nice a bloke. bloke, lovely bloke, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Who did you collect? Kyle Stanley. Yep, for not calling for at a US Open, hit his caddy's mum. Yeah, good yep. work, McIntyre. Anyway, he might be he might be yearning for a couple of pints at Marky Dan's pub back home in Oban. <laughs> But you'll need a, a winner's check to pretty much <laughs> to get home. Every, yeah, to, to get home and to pay for everyone's. If he bobs up with a GoFundMe, that'll be it for me. Yeah, that'll I'll turn my back away. on the game. <laughs> so I, I, I think, and he's he's quite an imaginative shot maker. Yeah, very much. And I think Not that could come into play um, around this golf course. Very good. At some point, too, a player like McIntyre, not because we've talked about, because he must know himself. He's got to look at himself and say, "This is ridiculous." I should win this this week. This is madness. Just get on with it. Well, it's only, only, what, 18, 19, 20 months ago that he was in contention at the Open. Yeah. So get on with it, Rob. And he just doesn't seem to have he doesn't go pushed on, on from there. Amazingly, for a guy who went and played college golf in the States, who's really still sticking with playing all these smaller DP World events, which is an interesting approach. Mm. East Tennessee, I think it was, University, the place where Rory McIlroy thought about going for three seconds and then went, <laughs> man, no, I'm probably going to turn pro. <laughs> yeah, uh, education's not really. Yeah, academia's yeah, not. Yeah, I don't think that's for me. Rod, a thought from you on Kenya? Well, I printed out the entire field. Wow. Over six or seven pages. I pasted it all up on the wall. How I incredibly dart, wasteful. I closed my eyes. I threw the dart at the board and I came up with Daniel Van Tonder. Yeah, that's a pretty good. Which I think he's an again interesting character. The tournaments like this, you're not going to pick a winner except by luck. So, but uh, can he control that right to left ball flight? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> when he Kenny, plays well, Kenny Perry esque that big. It's Kenny, like I'm going to hit a fade and it's yeah. a 15 yard draw. It's, when, he, I, when he plays Kenny well, Perry, Tom, <laughs> Tom Lehman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, but when it's he plays well, right he plays really well. So anyway, yeah. we'll see. Okay, we yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, we're just going to have a very quick look at the Women's Amateur Asia Pacific. One reason we are when, is... When you say we, you mean you, because I've done nothing to research. Correct. That. But it's we're going to have a look at it because it is one of the great initiatives in world golf, run by the RNA. Back in March, after a couple of COVID-affected years, saw it run behind the men's event at the same sort of time of year. Uh, so winner of this gets... Uh, starts at the AIG Women's Open, Evian Championship, Chevron Championship, as well as other events around the world, including Augusta National Women's Amateur, uh, some events in Korea and Japan. I think maybe an Australian Open start as well from memory. Winner from late last year in Thailand, Ting Huan Huang. I think I got that close to right. Goes by Tiffany. Much easier to say when you're asking <laughs> Let's a question. Let's go with that, shall we? Uh, is back at Singapore Island Country Club this week, where the Australian team consists of Justice Bozio, Keely Marks, Caitlin Pierce, Sarah Hammett, Jazzy Roberts, and Abby Teasdale. Big turnover in the Australian team, with a number of them, Kelsey Bennett, Kirsten Rudgerly, all turning pro. But Bozio was the best of the Australians last year and is developing into a very, very nice player. While well, Sarah Hammett and Jazzy Roberts are both very young, but I've watched quite play quite a bit of golf, and I'm extremely impressed. Sarah Hammett is an absolute flusher, so worth keeping an eye on. That will Justice Bozio has shot some seriously impressive low numbers at various TPS Correct. events this year. So she's yeah. clearly got skill and is just yeah. growing into yeah, um, absolutely. Four round and putting schools together. A, 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 a number of them make their way from the Athena last week, which again is another concept that deserves some praise. That very good. You didn't TV ask product. me about what I was thinking about this, but that's exactly what I was going to say. Really interesting concept, and you know, even anybody could watch that and find it entertaining. Absolutely. Just good stuff. The number of people I saw saying I came home from golf and caught the end yeah. of it on Saturday, and then I watched it yeah. on Sunday. And it's not a four-hour commitment. You can sort of sit and you, and, you, and you can sort of watch it and come back to it. And you, great thing about modern television, you can rewind it if you think you missed something while you're in the kitchen doing. Dishes, yeah, it's really good stuff. You, really if interesting. You're catching up on it, you can fast forward through you and Porter hitting a bunker shot. And it's great. <laughs> so that's all that's coming up in the week ahead, and we will keep you up to date with all of these events and more on our website, golfaustralia.com.au, where this week particularly you will see John Huggan lending his daily thoughts from the grounds at TPC Sawgrass. You can also vote for your favourite composite 18 holes in the country through Australia's greatest 18 competition offering a prize of five thousand dollars worth of titleist gear to one lucky entrant so keep your eyes there and we'll keep you all up to date on those events 
BJ, a pleasure as always. Thank you, Kieran. Rod, you are also here. That's Playing From The Tips, Episode 4. <laughs>